So uh, let's see what we're talking about today. Uh, three way, we'll get into three ways to get your customers and clients referring a whole lot more without you having to ask. So it's fortuitous that you mentioned the referral question because we'll show you the exact, we just happen to be showing you the program we created that works to do that. And then um, we're gonna be talking about using uh, some new cutting edge direct mail software that was originally developed for home service businesses to um, get your phones ringing in a way that they're not right now. Um, before we do that, because it's September and it's back to school month, um, we'll be sharing some marketing principles that all this is based on. This was, but before we do that, um, we recently, I took, my wife and I took the kids, we have three kids for those of you who don't know, Max, Ella, and Lily, they're 11, 9, and 5, to uh, Clifton Hill. We make a summer bucket list of, hey kids, what do you want to do this summer? What's the one thing you want to do? Everybody gets to pick something. And uh, Max's, my 11-year-old son, his pick was Clifton Hill. Um, so this time we did the Wax Museum. Um, so I don't get why Iron Man was in the Wax Museum because he's not made out of wax. But maybe it was just cool because it was the real costume, theoretically. Um, I... I think they took a page out of Barnum's book at one point because there was a separate door that I went into that my wife and kids did not go into and we got separated for a little bit because apparently I did not see the sign on the door that said Hall of Horrors. <laughs> and my wife and kids did and she smartly steered them away. Um, but this is me and the alien <laughs> uh, from Aliens. And the funny thing was later when I caught up with them and then Rebecca had to go to the bathroom, but there wasn't, so we had to, we ended up running back through the Hall of Horrors to go to the bathroom, because um, it was faster, and so then they, she was covering the girl's eyes and running through, and Max is walking around, and Max is going, I don't understand, I'm not scared. Did this it try to eat your forehead? <laughs> no, that was when I had shingles. We still need a new comedian, by the way, if you know anybody. Um, thank you, thank you. So Max, like, I don't understand. This isn't scary. This isn't scary. And then there was something that said that really creeped me out. And it was the many faces of Michael. <laughs> this is a true story. He said, I'm freaked out by the Michael Jacksons. And then I thought this was very intuitive of, you know, an 11 year old to say, Daddy, I don't understand. He how did he go from a poor, underprivileged, young African-American boy to a rich white man? And he said, um, so the music got him the money. But then I said, well, you know, he said in interviews that he had some rare skin condition that caused his skin to change colors. And Rebecca immediately interrupted with, that's crap. He must, he did whatever. So then I let them have that debate and kept walking. Um, but I thought it was interesting that the alien, all the horror movie figures didn't bother him at all, but Michael scared him. Um, and this is a kid who, um, have any of you ever watched the show Stranger Things on Netflix? So when I, we, all of Rebecca's friend, mom friends are talking about it. So I go to start watching it. I get creeped out in the first episode or two and I'm like, I'm not watching this. And then, Max starts hearing about it. Max is like, I want to watch so much. I'm, no, you're not watching it. You're not watching it. He watches it on his own. He's like, Daddy, what were you creeped out about? There's, it's fine. It's not scary. I'm like, oh, I can't get shown up by my 11-year-old, so I guess I got to watch it with him. So we watch it, and I said, that didn't scare you? Like, Michael does. But the Demogorgon monster, no problem. So I don't understand. All right, so the five secrets to creating marketing that generates new customers like magic, upon which everything that is coming will be based on and you want to write down the five, because this is what you should be basing all of your marketing on to make it actually work. The most important factor is the who. Who is your target market? Who are you going after? Who is that niche? There are, we have a saying in our world, there are riches in niches. If you are everything for everybody, you're really nothing for nobody. Because if you stand up and say, can you introduce me to any, somebody, we, my kids have learned this the hard way in our, class, in our house. I don't know anybody named somebody. Can somebody help me tie my shoes? 
Somebody, somebody, I don't know anybody named somebody. I'm off the hook, I don't have to tie their shoes. Um, so I'll give you an example of niching and the substantial difference it can make in the, um, you talked about webinars. In the seminar industry, there are a lot of professional service companies, whether Dean's doing a lunch and learn or whether a financial advisor is doing a dinner seminar to sell retirement planning. Um, the primary way 80% of those attendees at the free dinner seminar are driven is through invitations that look exactly like this. Uh, you're cordially invited. In this case, this is a financial advisor in Vienna, Virginia, and that's literally the invitation. That's the. I go to one at Ruth's Chris. Well, see, we had this discussion with them because they said we get records, we get lots of attendance, but nobody books an appointment. And I said they're there for the steak. That's why nobody's booking an appointment. They're there for the free food. You advertise. The biggest picture is free food. You advertise free food, and then you get surprised when people show up who only want the free food. In our industry, we call them plate lickers. <laughs> okay, it's a safe space. I like it. Thank you. What would you say the percentage of plate lickers versus real potential customers that show up? It depends on the invitation. It depends on who the target market is. So we hear this every day from professional service companies or financial advisors or medical clinics or hearing aid clinics or whoever it is who is marketing this way now because they've done it for decades and it worked although the market's gotten oversaturated. If you're ever down on your luck, if you're ever homeless, if you're ever hungry, go to any restaurant or hotel with a banquet hall, Salvatore's, Russell's, any of those, any night of the week, there will be at least three financial advisors doing dinner seminars. You can walk in and say, I forgot my invitation, and they will let you in, and you will have free dinner. All you have to do is listen to a presentation on annuities or life insurance or something like that. So. If you ever want to take the kids, you know, free meal. Kids eat free. Dean eats free too. Um, so there is. So if you use that invitation a lot, it's it varies according to the market in the seminar in the restaurant draw. Ruth's Chris would get more people than Joe's Steak, Jim's Steak Out or Joe's Steakhouse, um, but it's at least half are there for the free food. Um, it's funny. I did a seminar, a marketing seminar for financial advisors. Um, a number of years ago at Black and Blue, when Black and Blue first opened. And it was a huge draw because they hadn't been there yet. And we had 82 people. Like standing, people were literally with the plates, standing room only, eating standing up. And the day before, I got strep throat and lost my voice. And I literally couldn't talk. And other than the fact that we had 82 advisors coming and I was being paid to speak at the seminar by an insurance company, I would have canceled. If we had 10 people, if we had, I would have rescheduled you guys today. Sorry, well, I would have tried. Um, but literally, I couldn't talk. I gave the entire seminar as a whisper. It was the quietest seminar I've ever given. We also had the highest conversion in terms of people who hired us for marketing from that seminar, probably A, because they felt bad, B, because I was whispering and they had to be quiet to pay attention, and whatever reason, maybe I got points for playing sick. I don't know, going through the hurt. So yes, depend, the free food can be a draw. However, um, we have fun every, there is a two, one company in particular that's an 800 pound gorilla in this space in terms of mailing seminar, printing and mailing for you to fill your room. And we get hired all the time by people who will go, I, I'm sick of sending out 10,000 invitations to get a couple, a handful of people to show up and half of them are plate lickers. And we say the first problem you've got, other than the fact that the big picture is free food, we say you shouldn't give away free food because people will come for the free food, is who was the target market you sent the invitation to? And everyone will say baby boomers with money. Anybody over 50 in my city in a 10 mile radius with a couple hundred thousand in the bank. Well, what do all those people have in common? Nothing other than they eat. He said, so if you narrow down the target market, and change the marketing to match, magically you get a better response. So we had one financial advisor who was, um, we asked lots of questions to figure out what else you do that makes you relatable besides your profession. So we found out that this financial advisor was a big pet shelter person, donated to pet shelters, fostered cats, all kinds of pet activities, charities, kinds of stuff. So I said, let's use that in our marketing Let's also change who we're going after. 
let's go after affluent baby boomers with money, yes, but let's also sub-segment and only go after the women. And let's only go after women baby boomers with money who own cats. And you, you, she got the same look you did, the puzzled, what the heck is wrong with you look. But we changed the seminar invitation to say, will you be eating surf and turf in retirement or cat food? Because their biggest worry is they're going to end up a cat lady. Magically, we sent out a lot fewer. We, instead of 10,000 of these, we sent out a couple hundred of these. Um, and magically, we had an, it's like 20 times the response rate. And nobody was there for the free food because there wasn't any. Great idea. Change the target market, change the message. Magically, it works better. We also did another version of this with dogs, going to dog owners. We got a lower response. Still much better than the original, but significantly lower than cats. Because there's no stereotype, apparently, of I'm going to be eating dog food when I retire. It's all about the cat food. I don't know why. Because there's no crazy dog lady stereotype, but there is the crazy dog cat lady. Who's friends with my wife who has this lady. Still four kids and seven cats. Um, so when the animals outnumber the people, there's something wrong there. But that's a different story. Um, another thing that affects is we had you go around the room and say what you did. So a lot of people can't form a coherent sentence. Thankfully, all of you could. And you all could describe what you do with some clarifications required going back and forth. Now, when we work with um, financial advisor and say, who's your target market? So in any marketing consultation, when people come to us and say, help me grow my business, my first question is always, who's your target market? And a lot of people will get stumped on that question. And they will say, anybody. They can fog a mirror, they can write a check, I'm good. Something like that. Um, the standard one I get from financial advisors that Adrian has been brainwashed out of many years ago is I work with retirees and pre-retirees. That's literally everybody on the planet. <laughs> My 11-year-old is technically a pre-retiree by the definition of the word. We asked Adrian what she did already, and she told us, but a whole lot of times the answer is, I protect your peace of mind, which could also be a home security company. It could also be senior moving. It could also be, I was anxious on the ski slope. I mean, you could stretch it. It could be anything. Or I make sure you never run out of money in retirement, which you can't unless they got so much that you can't mess it up. So. Defining your elevator pitch, your what do you do, your 30 second commercial in the context of who you do it for will dramatically increase your response rate. So we had another financial advisor who we analyzed their client base and it turned out that their best client that they liked the most working with, that paid them the most money, that referred the most was a, and your political differences aside, this is his case, um, was a Republican hunter baby boomer with money. He was a big conservative Republican. He was a big hunter, had a radio show all about hating Democrats and shooting people. So that's his target market. So we changed his, I make sure you never run out of money in retirement to, this was a couple of years ago, I help conservative sportsmen protect the retirement nest egg from Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Thank you. It is a great market, and their biggest fear a few years ago was she was going to get elected, decimate healthcare, take their guns away. So you got to know your target market. Um, and his name is Nathan. And one of the other questions we ask, and you want to ask yourselves these questions when you're doing these exercises about your business, what do you like about your business? What do you hate? Because if I could wave a magic wand and, and make you have only the things you love, eliminate all the things you hate, you're living the dream, right? Bruce and I were talking the other day. If we could eliminate crazy clients, we'd be all set. That's our only issue. Yeah. Um, so we screen really, really well. We really try. But at least once a month, somebody gets through who turns out to be crazy. No matter, even though it says on the questionnaire, are you crazy? And they check, <laughs> no, I don't understand. Um, so one of the things that Nathan hated was Nathan, our Republican hunter guy, said, I hate wearing a suit. It's a monkey suit. I'm not wearing a suit and tie. I wish I didn't have to wear a suit and tie. I hate it. And I said, well, all of the pictures on your website, your brochures, your marketing pieces are all of you in a suit and tie. So what do you think people expect when they walk in the door? 
blinding flash of obvious, me in a suit and tie. I said, well, let's change it. And again, we're now no longer going after everybody. We're going after conservative Republican hunters. So let's make your lead generation, what do you want to wear to work? Jeans and a polo. I said, there's your new cover. How, to overcome the set, how Republican hunters can overcome the seven deadly investor traps that kill your portfolio's performance. He's in camo, polo, jeans, short sleeves, and has a camo background. No one ever asks him where his suit is anymore. So, yes. So is this one marketing campaign that is fo this focus? Does he have to do other marketing campaigns that are more broad? I'm just wondering, like, for someone, for him, in his case, does he, I mean, like, if someone who doesn't agree with him about hunting or Democrats, is he going to turn them away? I mean, That's the point. So the point is to be polarizing. So you specifically want, this is, this is all his marketing is now. Okay. This is he, a direct menu. It's also online. Okay. It's also internet. Because those Republican hunters are also on Facebook. Okay. They're also on YouTube. Okay, so he's really dedicating himself. Not, yes. It's not the case where it's direct mail and one group gets this email or gets this mailing with this market. So the cat people do. The cat people have different marketing campaigns that go to different target markets that all end up coming to the same place, bringing them into the office, and they're selling them the same services. Nathan, this took off and worked so well, Nathan said, I'm not doing anything else. I just want to work with the Republican hunters. My magic wand, this magic wand worked. I'm getting rid of, I'm, I'm not marketing to anybody else. So it's totally up to you and what you want to do with your business. Um, we had, shoot, you said I was just about, I had a good example. I forgot it. It'll come back to me. Okay. So that's all based on who is your target market. The next factor of five is where do they hang out? Where are you going to reach them? They have to be reachable in an affordable manner. If you've got to spend 10 grand a month in full page magazine ads to get them and you don't have a $10,000 a month magazine ad budget, it's not going to do you much good. They could be on social media. They could be on email. They could be direct mail. They could be an industry trade journal or association. It's some detective work, obviously, to go find them. And you may already know they get a senior home mover magazine. They're members of a trade association. The orthodontists all go, or members of the AOADAQRT, whatever that is. Who was, who was the guy that we had that sold expensive jewelry and went to the, to the horse show? Oh, oh, that's a great example. Thank you. All right, so we had a guy, a jeweler in Kentucky, and he, Traditional jewelry store marketing, big ads, brochures, TV, print, radio, um, advertising diamonds and prices and all of that normal stuff. And we talked about in the where they hang out section is the power of place. You can sell at a premium if you sell in a different place. So for example, um, we're huge fans of Disney because they're brilliant marketers and you can get two hot dogs in a bottle of water for about 20 bucks at Disney. We're here, that might be five bucks and it's Disney so you don't have a choice and you don't flinch and you just pay it. Or my favorite extreme pricing example is they sell a Mickey Mouse inflatable bouncy ball. It's like this size. You can get them at, well, Toys R Us doesn't exist anymore. In Canada, you can go get them at Toys R Us for three, four dollars. At Disney, it's a hundred bucks. Same exact item. And their biggest profit margin has nothing to do with the theme parks whatsoever. This is a little bit of Disney trivia. The money that they make, their highest margin is selling rain ponchos. So at Disney, if it rains in Florida, which is about every other day, everybody runs into the stores and magically any store will immediately, as soon as it rains, pull out, suddenly there will be racks and stacks of rain ponchos. Those rain ponchos are made in China. They cost nine cents a piece and they're sold for about 10 bucks. It's a sheet of plastic. Basically it's a garbage bag that will last one wearing before it falls apart. And the next day, if it rains, you gotta buy another one. So they actually have people doing a Native American rain dance on purpose every day trying to make it rain because not only do they sell rain ponchos, but then when they all run into the store, the kids make them buy stuff too. 
Oh, so you asked me about the jewelry store. That's where I was going. Thank you. Um, so we said power of place. Where else could you advertise? Where else could you sell? Where else could you show up where you have no competition? And did some research, did some digging, found out in his area of Kentucky, horses are a very big thing. Everybody lives on big farms. Everybody owns horses. And horses are not a cheap hobby. So they have a horse auction a couple times a year where you go and people are exhibiting and people are buying and selling horses. Well, apparently, we learned this, everyone, every guy who goes to a horse auction, doesn't, most of them aren't really, don't really need a horse. They've already got horses. They've told their wife they're just going with their friend Bob. Bob's in the market for a horse. Don't worry, honey, I'm not getting another horse. And magically, every time, they come home with another horse. So our jeweler rented a, the space to have a kiosk at the horse auction and marked up his prices 400%. Because if you're at the horse auction where you told your wife you wouldn't buy another horse and you just blew 50, 100 grand on another horse, if you pick up a $5,000 diamond tennis bracelet and go home and give her that, she's suddenly not so mad about the horse. And he was printing money, auction after auction, and he's been doing it for years and years and years, and no other jeweler has thought to copy him, even though he's had people at that horse auction come up and go, oh, I'm a jeweler too, this is a great idea, and there's more kiosk space, no one else has thought to copy it. So it's all about, so where is not just where you reach them, but it's also where you sell. Um, are they on Facebook? So Facebook, in their infinite stupidity, has changed their marketing once again. Um, so in an overreaction to the privacy issues, so you used to be able to advertise to people on Facebook based on their credit card purchase data. So you could see how much money they made. You could see how much their mortgage was. You could see what kind of car they bought, when they bought it, how much they paid for it. You could see what kind of food they bought at Wegmans. There was no privacy. Unfortunately, now there is, and all of the purchase data went away. So we had fun while it lasted, but you can still go into something called Audience Insights and find out everything you could want to know about your target market on social media. So for example, you can go analyze somebody else's fan base. So in this instance, if you can't see it, but I said, I want to know about people over the age of 40 who are into Netflix and Redbox. And it says magically, those people um, read the New York Times, listen to NPR, they like George Takei from Star Trek, Sulu, for those of you who watch Star Trek, they watch The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, um, they, watch Ellen De they like Ellen DeGeneres, they shop at Amazon and Target, they go to Starbucks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can learn a whole lot about who my tar target market is and where else they are going so that I can make marketing directly to them. Because your goal, when they see it, is for them to go, oh my God, that's for me. That's for me. Not, they sent the same ad to 10 million people, but this speaks to me, this guy's inside my head. Or lady is inside my head. Interesting thing, if I add Netflix Redbox and put in the Wall Street Journal, now I learned some other stuff. I learned that they like Dan Rather. I learned that they listen to U2 and the Beatles. I learned that they shop for clothes at Nordstrom's. They subscribe to The Economist. They go to Whole Foods. I learned all kinds of other fun stuff. So we've got, who is your target market? Where do they hang out? How are you going to reach them? So I'm going to use an example. Dean, you're going to be in, in this a couple times today. Um, so how are you going to reach them? That could be a Facebook ad, YouTube, Instagram, email, direct mail, TV, print, etc. Could be a networking group. Um, in this case, in one of Dean's previous lives, he used to work for ADP. I know, payroll guy, Andy, don't get mad. He sold his soul to the devil. Um, he worked for ADP, and he was trying to get in front of CFOs of companies that had 50 employees or more to talk about their bundled HR solution, I think, and why they should switch from paychecks. Right. Right, awesome. So he said, how am I gonna get in front of the C CFOs? They got like six gatekeepers. They're never gonna answer the phone. I can't cold call, blah, blah, blah. 
we came up with a creative how, a multi-step, what we call lumpy mail, meaning three-dimensional, direct mail campaign that actually worked really well. So you can do direct mail business to business because most business to business mail is incredibly boring. Look at your own mail. You have to stand out. The number one marketing sin, in my opinion, is being boring. So the first piece of the direct mail was a three by five postcard that was pink, looks like a while you were out slip, it immediately gets thrown away on purpose. Step two, a four by six postcard that immediately gets thrown away, but references the first postcard. The third piece is a three foot poster coming in a mailing tube that does not get thrown away. The secretary actually looks at it, puts it on the CFO's desk. The CFO goes, I don't know what the heck this guy is talking about. I, I don't know who this guy is. What are you talking about? He's been trying to get a hold of me for three weeks. And she goes, oh, maybe it was those other pink things I threw out. And the CFO goes, okay, well don't throw it out, but doesn't do anything. Step four is a five foot poster. Literally as tall, well, not as tall as me, but maybe as tall as Christian in heels. Um, a five foot high poster that comes in a mailing tube like this. Dean's phone rang 42% of the time, which is an insane response. Don't quote me. It's an insane response. It's not normal. An insane response rate in direct mail. And my favorite two stories that I'll tell really quick that Dean told me were one was he went in for the meeting with the CFO and this was literally framed and hanging on the wall. Wow. It's a reminder to think creatively. The second, he took it to his marketing department. The second one, which was more selfishly my favorite story, was because he walked in over to the CMO, showed him this and said, how come, if ADP can come up with something that's this creative, how come we don't have anything? And Dean said, in all honesty, I didn't come up with this crazy idea, sir. Um, these crazy marketing people did, but I'd be happy to make that introduction for you. So how are you going to reach them? What are you going to sell them that is different? What you do doesn't have to be different, but you have to market it differently. Because if, if you want to have an exercise in fun and stupidity, go in the yellow pages that is serving as your kid's seat raiser, um, look up personal injury attorneys, and you will see that every single ad is exactly the same. It's got a, there's 300 pages of ads. They're all a picture of the people in front of the fake law bookshelf. And it all says, we'll get you the most money and call us. That's, we're professional, we're hardworking, the insurance companies are scared of us, which they're not, um, and all that good stuff. But they're all the same. So how are you going to stand out? Um, I'll give you one more financial services example. We had a company that came to us and said, we are a heavy equipment leaseback investment fund. I will turn that into English for you. So you as an investor write a check. They take the money. Thank you. Aw, thank you. You're the best. She knew I didn't want potato chips, but I forgot to tell her I didn't want potato chips and she got me to get fries. That's awesome. That's service. That's all right. So heavy equipment leaseback fund. You invest your money. I go buy an oil tanker. I go buy a construction crane and I lease it to the oil co shipping company. And the lease payments and the interest are my profit because it, the oil company does not want it on their books as an asset or a, li as a liability. They just want to lease it and they get a big cash payment because I bought it from them and leased it back to the same company. So they get a big cash payday for their unperforming asset that now they just pay rent on. So I said, direct mail. And they said, direct mail doesn't work, we tried it. I said, what'd you send? This fantastic, gorgeous, boring brochure. That's why it doesn't work. I said, we're gonna make your heavy equipment leaseback fund that no one understands unless they read 50 pages written by your lawyers that is insomnia inducing, the prospectus. I said, we're gonna make it sexy. He said, you can't. I said, watch me. Forget about diamonds, heavy equipment is a girl's best friend. The gift that keeps on giving. That's the heavy equipment. That's the girl's best friend. Um, dazzle your loved one with an investment in heavy equipment, an ownership experience like no other, a unique gift that keeps on giving with an 8% annual distributions paid monthly. Quantities extremely limited comes with a gold frame certificate of ownership. The gold frames were gold painted frames that came from Michaels. 
uh, and a stunningly beautiful 3D laser engraved crystal detailed pump jack. It turns out in the oil and gas industry, they give like trophies to their top salespeople and it's like a block of glass and it looks like inside has been laser sketched like an oil derrick. They're actually really cool. You can get them where whatever's inside is anything you want it to be. Um, you may have seen them in high-end gift stores. Disney sells them now. You can get Mickey in there. Um, so they told us we were crazy. However, um, they sold out their investment fund. Um, we had responses from people calling to invest who called the 800 number. We had people, um, we had women calling who wanted to know where they could buy the dress. And my favorite is we had some gentlemen calling wanting to know if we could arrange a date with the model. I said, I was told that some of those people were married but wanted a date with her anyway. I said, you can't even see her face. Apparently that doesn't matter. So you can make anything sexy if you try hard enough. So who, what, where, how, and why? Why is what you do different? Because again, if you show up like everybody else, you'll get their results. So why is the answer to a question, which is why should I do business with you as opposed to anyone else who does what you do? The answer to that is your magical marketing proposition or MMP, which could be your 30 second elevator pitch. The goal of an MMP, you saw Nathan's, which was I help conservative sportsmen defend their nesting against Hillary Clinton. If he says that at the country club, if he says that at the shooting lodge, magically, all of a sudden, five, 10 hunters want to talk to him. If you, someone asks you what you do and they go, oh, that's nice, you didn't do a good job. The responses are, how do you do that? Tell me more. I didn't know that existed. Those are the three responses you want. That's how you know you did it right. So I'll give you some very famous magical marketing propositions. I am sure you can, you're going to shout out as soon as you know what the company was behind it because it built multi-billion dollar empires when you get it right. Fresh hot pizza in 30 minutes or less or it's free. Domino's which incidentally has been, this is a technical marketing term, has been wussified. And since Tom Monahan retired and made it, spent his billions building a Christian conservative development for people to live in, um, and now it's, this is an, there's an asterisk at the end, and it's, an, it's an estimated time of arrival only, and it's not free. The reason why he did that is because his dri when you were late as a driver of Domino's and the pizza was free, you had to pay for it. So their drivers were getting speeding tickets, getting into accidents because they didn't want to eat, pay for the $8 pizza. So for liability reasons, they said, we're not going to guarantee it's free. When it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. FedEx. FedEx, absolutely. They weren't the only place to ship overnight, just like Domino's wasn't, isn't the only place that delivers pizza, but those USPs, those magnetic marketing propositions built multi-billion dollar companies. Um, so the five levers of growth, we talked about who, what, where, why, and how, otherwise known as the right market, the right message, the right media, <coughs> executing all of that. You have to actually do it. You now knowing this won't do you any good unless you use it and being truthful about it because there's a lot of hype and BS in marketing and we're going to tell you to be honest or as honest as you can legally be. Um, there are three ways to grow a business. Number one is get your customers to buy more. You can do that by getting them to buy more of the same thing. I want another order of fries. You can get them to um, stay longer. Retention. How, how long do they stick around? You know, if you're a senior move guy and my seniors moved and I don't have any more seniors, you got to wait 20, 30 years before I'm going to use you again until you can get me to refer me to other old people that I know. Um, let's see, Ascension, can you get me to move up in terms of the tiers of service I provide? Silver, gold, platinum. Okay, you're selling me Bluetooth beacons and you have a pricing for that. Well, could we also do Bluetooth beacons and you'll create all the messaging for me and that costs more. Could you do, not only will you create the messaging for me, but those Bluetooth beacons have to drive me to a website or a landing page and it needs to be HTTPS, it needs to be secure. Do you have one, Mr. Client? No, I don't. Well, you should have a dedicated landing page that is secure just for this campaign. I can offer you one of those too. So you keep moving up the ladder. Sure, I can counsel you through your divorce, 
and manage your money and refer you to a therapist and have tea with you three times a week, but that all costs more money. Uh, so those are some examples. Number two, get them to buy at higher prices. Raise your prices. If you got nothing out of this meeting and all you did was you went home and you raised your prices by 20%, magically it would have been worth it. I wouldn't do 20% all at once. I might do 5% then 5% then 5% then 5% because usually nobody will complain about a couple percent or even notice. And when someone has the ability, when someone has the ability to pay more and they buy into your concept, price can become elastic. Meaning you can stretch it and charge them more. So we can get them to buy more often. We can get them to buy at higher prices. Um, what do we have to do to get them to buy at higher prices? They've got to have the ability to buy. We've got to be able to afford it. They've got to have the willingness to buy. Um, these are two of my favorites, replication and multiplication potential. So replication means can they duplicate themselves? Can they refer you to other people just like them? And then multiplication, instead of one referral at a time, are they a center of influence? So could that accountant who doesn't do payroll, instead of you getting one referral and Errol says, sure, take over my payroll, you're hired, and you got one client, if that accountant, Mark, sends out an endor a letter of endorsement to all 300 clients, now maybe you get 10 or 20 at a time. Instead of replication, you've multiplied. Does that make sense? Yes. Awesome. Um, now, in order to do that, in order to get them to buy at higher prices, you can't sell vanilla ice cream. If you notice, if you look in the premium ice cream section at Wegmans, all of the other premium flavors are priced higher than even premium vanilla. Because it's vanilla. How much can you, sure, I can use better milk and fattier milk and better sugar, but ultimately it's vanilla. That's why it's vanilla. You can't be vanilla if you want to charge premium pricing. Um, I have a uh, colleague in the college planning business helping get your kids financial aid for college. And he was a traditional financial advisor uh, until he learned all of this and decided to make himself the college advisor for the 1%. Got paid to place a couple articles in some media publications calling him that so he could now say, look, CNN says I'm the college planner for the 1%. Um, he raised his prices. He changed his marketing to go after people who thought they made too much money for their kids to get financial aid instead of people whose kids would definitely get financial aid because they could afford more. He had a separate phone number, VIP phone number they got to call that went straight to him so they didn't have to talk to a secretary. They had a separate, um, they got served wine at their meetings. They got a set, there was a separate entrance with a red carpet to his office that only they got to come into that used to be a storage closet that they just knocked on the wall and made an entrance, VIP entrance with a red carpet and VIP letters on the door and all of a sudden everyone's going, what's the VIP entrance? I want to get in there. He didn't change what he did any different. He just changed how he positioned it. So it's not vanilla anymore. Jump on the phone number real quick for one thing. That separate phone number, we had a client that was doing an investment plan, uh, a minute for accredited investor, minimum $25,000 in the fund. So if you invested your $25,000, call this number, you can but if you invested 100000 or more, then you got the concierge line. And you called the concierge line. And it said, okay, you're a special investor that way. Makes a difference. Different phone number for a different group of people. Technically, they were answered by the same people. <laughs> but their phone said which one it was calling in from, so they knew to be extra nice. Yeah, right. It's funny. Um, one of my friends is Roland Frazier, who is one of the partners in Digital Marketer, largest digital marketing company in existence. And he posted the other day, he's always traveling somewhere and he's always staying in the presidential suite or whatever. And he posted the other day, here is, this is my, want to know how I get all these amazing suites and don't pay for them. I have secret upgrade strategies that I use to get free upgrades to first class and the top suites at hotels. Comment below, you know, and I'll share it with you. And I commented. And he sent me the strategy and I said, okay. Um, and I tested it today for the first time because it was like a week ago that I saw his post. And I called the number and instead of what I have normally done is I look up the flights on Kayak, which is an app, and then I'll find the flight I want. And usually I fly Delta most of the time. So then I'll go to the Delta app and book it. 
Um, well, I learned that doesn't get you any free upgrades. I learned if you call the Amex number, travel number, and book the exact same flight with them, not only was it cheaper, uh, magically cheaper this morning, but they also said, well, because you called the you know, platinum booking line, you know, magically you get these upgrades. And they don't cost you anything. So you're gonna buy a main cabin, regular price, generic ticket, and then we're immediate, you're gonna get an email saying you have that, and then you're gonna get an email five seconds later saying congratulations, you've been upgraded to first class at no charge. And I said, Roland, you're the man. <laughs> Separate phone number. Um, and get more customers, which is why you're all here. So you can get more customers with the stuff that we're talking about today. You can get other people's customers, OPC, other people's customers. So, synergy. Doesn't, so the ski guy can work with the ski instructors in the ski shops and get them together. Who else serves the orthodontist? Is there an accountant who works with a whole bunch of orthodontists that he can cross promote with? Um, is there a business attorney? Is there, who else are you in, who else serves the same customer and you guys can trade? Entity acquisition, that would be going and buying the other firm that serves your customers to acquire their customers in one shot. Um, some lies you're being told before we get into, into these two things. Um, one, they're being told that people don't read anymore. This is not true. Um, what age group would you say has the shortest attention span? Uh, zero to 30. Zero to 30. Now, interesting enough. Shortest attention span and they don't read. They're all on their phones, right? Yet the number, which should be the number one biggest selling category in physical published books, not e-books, physical bookstore books is teen fiction. I thought they don't read. Why are they buying so many books? Well, it's required. Required. I mean, it's, the, school, the school requires them to have an off-topic reading program. Not required them to read Twilight. Twilight. Correct. <laughs> They won't watch more than seven minutes. Our average, we're finding the longer we make our webinars, the better they work, the more people buy. So we started at 45 minutes and we have clients now whose webinars are 90 minutes and people are staying all the way through and buying at the end. Because think about it, if you sold vacuum cleaners door to door, here's my analogy, and you knock on the door, forgive the stereotype, housewife enters, we'll go back 20, 30 years, and and you say, want to talk to you about Kirby vacuum cleaners. And she says, sure, come on in. And you go inside and you start your pitch and you're used to getting the door slammed and your pitch is two minutes. And then you stop and say, hey, thanks for your time. And she says, I'm not going anywhere. You can tell me more. Would you say, no, I said my two minutes, I'm running away. Or would you keep talking until she bought or kicked you out? You should keep talking until she buys or kicks you out. So we found that as we kept adding more time to the webinar, it worked better because they were more interested. Uh, nobody has a DVD player anymore. Did you know that Netflix, your lovely video streaming company, doesn't make any money on Netflix? They actually lose money on their streaming service that we all have. They made $2 billion last year and every single penny of their profits came from direct mail. Came from mailing you the DVD in the envelope and you mailing it back. Somebody's gotta have a DVD player to drive $2 billion in direct mail DVD rentals. It's not one guy. They still do that. Um, and offline is dead. Um, the social media experts would tell you that you should only be doing online stuff which also is not true. Um, there's actually less competition in your mailbox, in case you know, haven't noticed, than ever before, because everyone thinks they're supposed to be all online. So that means if there's less competition, there's more room for you and it's cheaper. Um, okay, another concept before we dive in. Last one, um, financial efficiency. Uh, Dan Kennedy, my marketing mentor, says you can't fix bad math. So that's like saying, well, we lose 50 cents on every product we sell. Well, we'll just make it up in volume. It doesn't work. You'll just lose a lot of money faster. So financial efficiency number one is the number of times you turn over a dollar. Um, I'm the co-host of the Sharkpreneur podcast with Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank. Um, and 
his fellow Shark Tank uh, member and, and friend Kevin O'Leary says, my money are soldiers and they go out into battle and I expect them to bring back prisoners, capture those other dollars and bring them back. So how many times does your dollar go back and get more dollars? If it takes a year you, for to turn it over, how fast can you grow? If you can speed up the t that to a week, a month, if you speed it to a month, now you got 12 times the revenue. Um, what is your customer value in relation to your customer cost? A lot of times people say, what should my marketing budget be? And that's the wrong question. The right question is, how much does it cost you to acquire a customer? How much money do you make? What's your ROI? How many customers do you want to buy? Um, we had a situation yesterday with a company that, sell, that is an affiliate for virtual private networks. So this is, I don't want my internet to be public from Time Warner or wherever. I want my own private network, whether it's for gaming or investments or adult entertainment, whatever reason. And I said, the first thing I said, they get 30,000 unique visitors a month to their website. No paid ads. I said, first of all, that's awesome. Let's spend some money and make that number bigger. And there's no lead capture on the website. 30,000 people hit their website. They either take their quiz to go find out what virtual private network they should get and then go to that site and buy it or they go away. The quiz is asking all sorts of great questions to determine what they should buy, but there's no, we've got your results, give us your name and email and we'll give them to you. I said, so if that person doesn't buy right away, you've lost them. And they said, yep. But nobody else in our business does that. We've looked at all 10 of the major VPN affiliates and none of them have lead capture. So we didn't do it. And I said, okay, if everybody copies everybody else, that's marketing incest. Everybody gets dumber and dumber and dumber as we have inbreeding. I said, just because they're not doing it, if you're the only guy doing it, you will have a mailing list, an email mailing list every day growing and growing and growing. And you will be able to pay more to acquire a customer than anybody else, which means you win and you can go buy the other 10 companies which is what is your customer value in relation to what does it cost you to get them? And then what is your leverage of your non-cash capital? So do you have a machine that you use in your business that's only being used eight hours a day because you work eight hours a day, but there's another business that's open second shift that you could rent it to? How else can you squeeze money out of what you've got? So that is going to take us to our internal marketing machine, which is how to get your clients referring like crazy without having to ask. <laughs>